Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Today I have a rant, and it's something that's just, I just got to get off my chest. Hey, it's my own opinions, it's my own thoughts and ideas, you know, it's, uh, but maybe they don't carry any weight, maybe they do. Let me, t I'll, I'll wait to hear from you guys to see what you think, okay? But what I want to talk about is the linear power supplies for audio amplifiers. And are they really linear? Or have we been led astray? Have they lied to us? Well, I kind of feel like they have. Because um, I don't think they're linear. I think they're low-frequency switchers. And I'm going to show you why, okay? Now, here, let me just give you some background. I, I'm going to do a collaboration with John at John Audio Tech. He's done a nice job designing an amplifier. And... I'm going to design a power supply for it, and maybe two. And so I was looking at a linear power supply, a linear power supply design, and a switching power supply, which I'm really excited to do. I want, I'm want i really anxious getting this switching power supply design, which I'm going to go through the board design. I'm going to go through everything with you guys. But uh, as I was doing some research and looking at why people don't regulate their linear power, their linear power supplies, uh, I just realized... You know, the only reason they don't is it's too expensive. A lot of people won't buy into it. A lot of people are happy. A lot of people are not going to buy a power cord that costs 50 bucks. is what this one costs. It checks a lot of boxes that audiophiles are looking for. They won't buy this one, probably. They would buy a $250 cord from someone on YouTube who's selling them, who they trust and believe in, instead of buying something off uh, Amazon. But I would buy this one. Or save your money and don't even buy something like this. This has shielded cable, all these things. I didn't rant on power cables. But anyway, people also spend a lot of money buying a power regeneration unit. And they do all this other stuff. And I was thinking like, I was listening to some of these guys. Uh, I think it was a guy from Stereo Review. was talking about how he was putting a new system in his in his house, his electrical system, and he added a breaker, and he said, oh, it just ruined the sound. And I thought, how can that be? That's absurd. But then I, I started thinking, I go, well, it wasn't the breaker they added. They probably added, you know, another power run and added more copper between, or distance between him and his service entrance where the power actually comes in the home. And he's just got more footage of wire now. It's got to be voltage drop. Because a breaker, that kind of stuff, having this power cord, a big power cord like that, well, uh, it's got large gauge wire, so it's going to limit how much voltage drop you have. Skin effect is a non-issue. Uh, the EMI shielding is a non-issue. But thinking about the, uh, um, the power cable, the copper in it, uh, you know, it's like, well... Maybe maybe that's it. So anyway, I was thinking about all these things that people talk about and how it affects their sound. And if there is any truth in it, it has to be voltage drop. And even within the power supply, the power comes in and you're going to get voltage drop through your transformers. It, it drops the voltage down, but it also is going to have copper losses, IR losses, current resistance, you know, Ohm's law, current times resistance voltage. So you're going to have voltage losses through here. You know, you're going to have connectivity losses with all the other wires that you have going between boards. And maybe that's what it is. So maybe people are, some people have amplifiers that aren't well designed. <laughs> I mean, they're not designed against those voltage drops. Or, you know, the other thing is, as the voltage drops, it creates more ripple on your capacitors. And maybe that extra ripple is... You know, you're hearing that through your output stage. And I'm going to show you why that possibly could be true. So there could be some truth to this. If you're dropping a little bit of voltage, you're creating a little bit of more ripple on your capacitors, on your low frequency switching power supply. That's why I think it should be called. And why not make a linear power supply where you actually regulate it and linearly regulate it, turn it into a regulator. Okay, 
some people just don't. And I, I think the reason why they don't has even been forgotten. You know, the friend of mine who got the job, you know, he quit, high-paid job, went to work for this audio company. One of the stories he told me, you know, as we were talking about this, the power spies and stuff, he said, you know, one of the things he just... It just drove him nuts is he'd ask questions and he'd be told, well, that's the way we've always done it. Like pat him on the head, like you'll get it. You're new to this industry. We've been doing this for a while. So he's doing a switching power supply for the class D amplifier, the new class D amplifier that's being designed. So he thought for sure we're going to, you know, regulate the power supply rails, right? And at first they said, well, no. And he's like, why not? Well, because, you know, it's the way we've always done it, lad. You know, you'll catch on. And he's like, why wouldn't you regulate the output? Like, it makes no sense. And so anyway, um, I think it's just been around so long that they haven't done it. It's become accepted. And we just go around calling them linear power supplies, which we should stop doing because it lets the uh, audio guys doing these amplifiers off the hook, you know. They should be, if they're going to call them linear power supplies, they should regulate them. Now, you know, like Paul at PS Audio, he, they, they realized him and his partner, when they first started PS Audio, they realized uh, through some testing that his partner said, hey, come here, check this out. And, and he had regulated the input stage and like, wow, what a difference that made. And as Paul says, the reason they don't regulate the output stages is because, you know, they regulate the input stage and that gets you most of the benefit. <laughs> but where's the rest of the benefit? And he was answering a question on one of the things. You know, I could be, you know, I'm not saying verbatim what he said or whatever, but it's something to that effect. You know, very close. <laughs> anyway, watch his videos about, you know, just search for uh, PS Audio, uh, you know, regulated power splice. And I think you'll find the videos I found. But, uh, yeah, anyway, um, I, I think we've just been led down a, a path. And uh, I think it's to save money because most customers aren't going to spend the money for power regeneration units or power cores. They're going to be just happy with the amplifier they have. But, you know, I think there's, there's room out there for a real linear power supply. Meanwhile... Let's start calling them low frequency switchers because the audio guys will hate that being called a switcher and they'll go, Oh gosh, it's a switcher. We can't be called a switcher. We got to get to a linear power supply. <laughs> anyway, they, they'll debate that all day long, probably. But all right, let's get on with this video, okay? All right, hopefully, I got the glare off the, uh, the board here. So here's typical power supply, right? You got your input stage, maybe an EMI filter, uh, isolation stage, transformer, usually a step-down transformer, your rectification stage. Now, this is this is where I want to come back to. Uh, then you have bulk capacitor stage, right? Your big old bulk capacitors. So this is your big old reservoirs that try to give you a nice flat DC voltage, but it is an unregulated DC voltage unregulated okay also this is what people refer to as linear power supply i want to argue that it's a switching power supply these diodes are commutating right they're switching on and off all right so we got some waveforms now uh you know we have a sine wave coming in right and then the rectifiers put all these blips for the positive voltage rail, they put them all on the top top part. So uh, one cycle ends up with two blips. So 60 hertz turns into 120 hertz over here. 8.3 8 milliseconds between. Then the bulk capacitor smooths that off so you just get the ripple and it discharges in between when it's providing power. Okay. Now... 120 hertz so think of music if you have 200 hertz 400 hertz uh, music playing then it's faster than this so it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of current from this right 
So let's say this is 120 hertz. And let's say your music, let's just say three times, say 360 hertz. You're going to get three pulses of music in one of those. So you're going to drain it three times. So you can see how this is a very slow system. And it's a switching power supply. The diodes turn on and off, on and off. They're switching on and off. So it's a low frequency switcher. So these diodes, it's called commutation. They, this di diode, uh, two sets of these diodes turn on to give this pulse, and then two others turn on to give the negative pulse. So the current is pulse, pulse, like that. Okay, that's huge harmonics. Now, uh, power factor, that's also a big problem with this. Think about instantaneous power. Instantaneous power at this point, well, it's zero here, zero here. So it's zero. But somewhere halfway up the wave, it's still zero. So zero times whatever voltage that is, say it's 40 volts, 50 volts, still zero power. You don't get any power until the voltage gets high enough to turn on one of these diodes, which is right here at the top. And then it gives a big old pulse of current. So the bigger bulk capacitors you put out there, the flatter this starts to look and the skinnier these things get and the taller they get. So you get all this switching current noise from your switching, from your low frequency switching power supply. So we got to stop letting the audio industry tell us we have a linear power supply. Unless you add another stage here, this is still a low frequency switcher. AC to DC. Yikes. AC to DC low frequency switch. That's what you got. Okay, so now we've added the stage that makes this a linear power supply. Now we've taken the input low frequency switcher and changed it to a linear power supply. So we have a linear regulated output, flat voltage. Takes care of a lot of problems, okay? If there are any problems, it takes care of them. And we already had this one. This is for the input stages of your power amplifier, but now, we add this. So that is magic, guys. Once you add a linear regulator and regulate your output stage, yeah, it's not efficient. Well, neither is class A amp. A, B is a little bit more efficient, but we're not talking about efficiency. We're talking about quality, right? We're talking about signal integrity, power integrity. So if you think that adding one of these or that adding a breaker to your house and you know solar system or something like that and it all of a sudden your sound system screwed up because something happened when they added that breaker if you have craziness like that going on those small voltage drops that might have happened before you get to your receptacle and then maybe from your receptacle to your amplifier maybe you drop a little bit more voltage because of your power cable well, those small little minute things, if there's any chance you can hear the difference in that stuff, then this will make the difference. Let's go to the next uh, slide. I'm going to talk about the linear power supply a little bit more. <laughs> okay, I hope I got the glare off my board here. Uh, linear regulator, simplified circuit, of course, very simplified. Input bulk capacitor, this is the bulk. These are the bulk capacitors come off our bridge rectifier. Now, the thing is, in this case, we don't need as big a cap because we can allow some ripple. Uh, you know, that's okay. So we don't have to use as big as caps. The diodes don't have to be quite as noisy at the input. So we can kind of improve that whole situation, okay? Now, the other thing is we put a cap out here. This cap is going to be high quality capacitor, maybe a couple different types of capacitors. Just, you know, now there's going to be people that say they can hear the difference between the different types of caps, which I'm not gonna say you can't because uh, now what you could do is if, let's say you put a ceramic and a poly, then you should be able to, uh, there's some difference in the way the capacitors are made and I could see that being a benefit. But anyway, the point is, is this capacitor is for high frequency response time. I've heard people say that linear regulators, one of the cons is that, and, and somebody who's actually very noted and actually wrote a book, who listed uh, negatives or cons of a regulated power supply was that 
uh, transient response, which is absurd. It's ridiculous. Now, he might have been talking about switchers at the time, which still ridiculous, absurd. Uh, it's not true. Your pulsating DC power supplies with just a bulk capacitor, they're, they're, they're only as fast as 120 hertz here in the States. Somewhere else in the world, you might only have 100 hertz, right? So that's pretty slow. That's really slow. That's uh, 120 hertz is 8.3 milliseconds between pulse. So that's very slow. So if you have music that's happening at 200 hertz, well, that's not going to keep up with it, right? You're going to start draining those caps. And what if you have something at 3 or 4 or 500 hertz? Those frequencies can be tough because they're low frequencies, meaning a lot of energy, but they're faster than what this guy's been filled up at. Okay, now what happens if it's 120 hertz music? No, I mean that that can be a weird thing because it can beat against the the charging cycle. Of this it can actually be a negative thing actually. Now if you're uh, let's say 100 hertz, maybe it's a little bit better. But now you're gonna let let's say you're playing music at 40 hertz, you're gonna have two charge cycles in between, so you're gonna have two ripples on top of your music. No. So, I mean, on top of the voltage rail, I should say. How that affects your music, I'm going to show you that in a moment, okay? But that's where the linear regulator power supply can really improve. I could see it really improving music. And people that, you know, think they can hear the sound of a cable, power cable. <laughs> you know, if, you, if, you think, if your system's that sensitive that you can hear that minute voltage drop in the input because of that power cable change, then, um, then wow, a regulated power supply, you'd be floating in heaven. Because after what we're going to do is we have this pulsating DC that comes into this cap, right? It char and so the cap charges up, it turns it into this blue waveform. So once we add this bulk capacitor after the bridge rectifier, then we uh, charge up that cap and we just get this ripple, okay? So what we do for the regulated supply is we choose some voltage below that ripple uh, and we take into account the fluctuations of the input voltage, okay? Not, you know, brownouts and that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about your normal you know, plus or minus, whatever it is, 5% fluctuation of the input. You take an account of that here, and then you're going to get a DC voltage here. So you have a plus DC voltage rail for your plus rail, and you do the same thing for your negative rail. Once you've done that, your power supply, this linear regulated power supply, the linear power supply has completely isolated you from anything this way. Because this... This, power, this regulator is very, very fast. Uh, the input has all this energy that it can drop down to this level here. So it can drop down to here, no problem. It's a transistor, operates just as fast as your amplifier, okay? So this guy is super fast, and this guy, and it's going to regulate. It's going to hold that voltage. So you're, you're going to have an... I could totally understand someone seeing a power supply like this going, wow man, my music has just changed. And I would say, yeah, and it's measurable. You can measure that. So, uh, and, I, and I'll sh I'm going to show you why you can measure that. But anyway, so there you go. Uh, once we regulate those power supplies, then we can call them linear power supplies. Regulating the input stage to a power amplifier and saying, well, we got most of it corrected using the, you know, similar words to someone else. Uh, most of it... I mean, I, I would think that the audio files would be cringing. Wait, you said most? Wait, where's the rest of it? <laughs> it is, it's kind of crazy how marketing departments are so good at saying, hey, look, rabbit. Hey, look, rabbit. Hey, THD. You know, I, I mean, they, they got us looking in the directions they want us to look. Oh, hey, guys, you won't believe it. And you know what? We can't measure it. Um... But you can hear the difference, I swear to God. Put one of these bad boys on there. Now, this is a $50 cable. This is it. I don't care how much money you spend. You're not going to get something better than this. Now, unless you have a gigantic power supply that needs more current. But if you're a 50 amp, 15 amp circuit, this power cord right here is amazing. Checks all the boxes. Has shielding, which you don't need. Has all the kinds of stuff. 
I'll put a link for this guy down below. I bought this just for that last rant video I did. But you don't need it. If you ever rate... Well, let me say this. You want you don't want to drop voltage at the input of your circuit. You want the efficiency. You want to maintain the volts that you can get at your input stage without dropping it through your filter stage and all that. That's why I think... I'm sure of it. That's why some people plug power conditioners in and they go, oh, I don't like the sound of that. And I I could believe it. I mean, I hate to say I want to believe it. If you have an expensive amplifier, I would hope that it'd be designed better than that. But guys, your Class A, Class A, B amplifiers, when you add that extra margin of voltage above, you know, what the ripple can be and all that, your amplifier, if you're trying to play music notes that's going here to here, plus minus rails, and your voltage rails are way up here, it's not going to matter. You're not going to drop it enough to make a difference. You just won't. But if you, if it drops, if you're operating close enough to those rails that you actually go up to, yeah, that's you're definitely going to hear that. So, um, and and I'll give it to you that it is possible that you could be hearing um, a little bit of change because of that ripple, because your impedance, your input is giving you more ripple. And shame on the audio amplifier guys for coming out with AC power generation units when all they need to do was regulate the output stage and tell people, hey, if you really want the best amplifier possible that we can make, we've got a fully regulated power amplifier here here it is it's a gigantic beast but you're gonna love it you know how many people i think would just eat that up you know those people that spend thousand bucks two thousand bucks or twenty thousand bucks or maybe even the people that spend 250 bucks on a power cable maybe even those people would would trip over themselves to buy that amplifier and you know what i, I i'd really be interested to hear that because and to even measure that because I, I would believe that that would be a remarkable or a measurable difference in the output. So, let's go see why. All right, guys. So, here is a data sheet of a MOSFET that might be used in an audio amplifier output stage. And this is a typical part. I found an amplifier board that had this part on it. So, I just want to show you this is just really the first one I came up with. It's an IRFP244. It's put out by Vache. It was an international rectifier part. That's why the IRF and certain lines were sold to Vache years ago. Uh, but this is a TO247. You see how large, the, this is a large package. If you're familiar with the TO220s, this is quite a bit bigger. So there's a little description talking about the TO220, you couldn't get quite enough power out of them, so they went to these larger devices. Okay, so it's a 250 volt part. Here, let's just scan down here and look at the the absolute maximum ratings. 250 volts, drain to source. This is voltage drain to source. The drain current's 15 amps, and that is a 25C, and it's continuous current. 9.7 amps at 100 degrees C. So you could, somewhere in this range you can operate continuously if you need to. For an amplifier, it would look somewhat continuous. Uh, now pulse drain current is 60 amps. So um, very capable of handling all the current. It's a 150 watt part from right here you can see that. Okay, there's a couple important curves I kind of want to show you. One thing is we scroll through the spec here, talks about how this large package can transmit heat to the heat sink. We have these dynamic responses right here, these capacitive, there, a lot of them have to do with capacitance. And that's one of the things I want to show you. It's not as simple as a fixed table like this, so they provide some curves, okay? It's kind of a moving target. So let's come down here to these curves. Okay, now really, I think 
in these curves, this one here in the top left and the bottom right are the two I want to just kind of zoom in on. One here in the bottom left is really just a zoomed in view of the, this curve up in the top left, this first part of the curve. Uh, so let's just zoom in on this guy. And what I want to show you is here's drainage source across the bottom. Both these curves we're going to look at, it's a drainage source thing. So as your drainage source on your FET is, let's say you have 50 volts on it, and then you put some gate current on it. So in this case, this bottom curve is 4.5 volts on the gate. So you could pull this much current out of it, okay? And uh, whatever this thing is right here. So here's 10 to zero power. So it's some small amount of current with 4.5 volts, okay? And then as you go up to the end, it, I'm sorry, this, the resolution on these, this curve is just unbelievable. It's really hard to see. I think this 4.5, 5, 5.5, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then it goes non, you know, somewhat nonlinear. But it, what is nonlinear is you see the gaps between each one of these things, they get closer and closer. You have to apply less and less voltage difference to get more and more current. Uh, so that's nonlinear, so, but let's just say that you're playing some music and it's going to go up to some amount of current and the voltage is going to drop down from drain to source down to this range. Well, if your ripple is also sagging, then really the drain to source voltage is going to be less. So it's going to be maybe over here. Well, see, these curves are not linear that there's a, uh, you can see how they kind of raise as they go up in voltage across the drain of source. And it's kind of hard to see, I know, but it, like right here, you can see how these lines are separating here. But, and we're kind of zoomed out and it is log log graph. So that makes it even more difficult to see. But you, I think you can still see that it, it does change. So as, as you're playing, some music and you need to apply more gate voltage to get more current uh let's say you apply the current to this level the voltage on the gate source to where i am right here on this line well if the drain source voltage drops down here it's going to have a little bit less current so the feedback is going to have to tell the gate to source to pump it up a little bit more to get that that line that current where it needs to be right so you can see it's non-linear the feedback should be able to take care of that. It's a very small change. I'm just pointing out that as you have ripple on your FET, the drain to source, let's just, just say you're playing the constant output. You know, you can see how that ripple is, your gain is going to have to continuously uh, drive your gate to keep that thing steady. Okay. Now, here's that dynamic part. Uh, even I mean, that's dynamic itself, but this is... You know what came out of the dynamic table above and it is the uh, drain to source voltage again across the bottom but in this case we have capacitance on the on the vertical curves now we're looking at the capacitance because we have these parasitic capacitances on the FET uh, right here this is the drain to source plus the gate to drain capacitance, and that's what we call COSS, and that's this curve. And then we have the gate source capacitance and the gate to drain capacitance. Those both together are called CISS, that's the input. So the gate, it sees the capacitance to the source and it sees capacitance to the drain. So that's why that's called that. And on the output, it's looking at the drain to source and gate and gate to drain so it's everything from the drain down to source or drain down the gate so that's the output capacitance and then the crss is uh, just gate to drain so now the gate to drain that capacitor is actually that's this one right here so it looks small it's the smallest value but it has the biggest voltage change because as your drain is changing these huge voltage waves uh your gate doesn't change that much so you're you're getting a huge change on this capacitor and energy on the capacitor is voltage squared so it's one half cv squared 
So it's the voltage squared. So that means that this one actually, even though it's the smallest capacitor, actually has maybe the biggest uh, you know, effect on driving the FET. Okay. So if you look, you can see how drastically it changes with the voltage across the drainage source. So again, you're playing music, so you're you're going up and down this line, so you're going up and down this curve. Hopefully, maybe you're saying, okay, I'm going to go up and down this linear part of the curve because other parts of it you can tell are totally non-linear. But then you have ripple coming in, and now the ripple's dropping or rising the voltage from drainage source too. So on top of your music changing, your feedback again has to correct for the difficulty in driving the, this capacitance as it gets higher. So as it gets higher, it's a little more difficult to drive. So your um, feedback has to control for this too. So you, can, so you might be able to see how driving these two curves, it's, it's just extra things your feedback has to do besides you know, just giving feedback to the input to the output to maintain proper gain. It's also being affected by the gain of the FET up here in the left corner or the capacitance changing in the lower right corner. So, you know, it's not as trivial as it might seem at first, but that's part of the feedback circuit in your amplifiers to take care of those things. All right, let's take a look at a BJT uh, transistor. Now this is a complementary set and it's meant for audio amplifiers and it was pointed out in Douglas Self's book that he found these transistors and uh, he thought they're you know possible good complementary pair for an audio amplifier. So it says excellent high linearity gain, total harmonic distortion characterized and yeah, so here we go, the PNP and the NPN. Now these are 250 volt parts and 16 amps. So similar to that MOSFET we looked at before. Uh, all right, and in this data sheet, we also have the dynamic characteristics, talking about uh, THD and so on, and the gain bandwidth, okay? And the output capacitance. And let's look at, right here this is the curves for collector emitter voltage so this is the voltage on the power rails okay and if we get a little closer look here this is pnp and this is the npn now on the vertical rails you see the current right and this is the base current these curves so for base current of 0.5 amps you get the bottom one one amp 1.5 or two amps so instead of uh, gate voltage like we had on the FET, we get current for the base because these are current driven devices, right? The one thing you might notice right off the bat is for a half an amp on the NPN, you get uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 amps. Half amp over here, you're only getting 10, 15. So with the amplifier swinging up and down, when it goes to the PNP side, it's going to have us to swing a little bit higher, drive a little bit higher to get the PNP to put out the same kind of voltage swing as we get on the NPN. Now, the other part of this is, uh, you know, related to our voltage rails. Now, this curve right here actually kind of drops a little bit. The other ones are a little flatter, but they, they do have a little wiggle in them, and they do increase with... Uh, collector voltage. Same over here on the NPN. They're more uniform probably, right? So maybe you could say that's a little bit more linear. But you can see that as the voltage is changing the, across the collector to emitter, we're getting a different amount of current to the collector based on the base. So again, the feedback should account for this it is already accounting for some differences between the NPN and the PNP but now it also has to take account the ripple on top of the changing music signal so this is just where I think that a regulated 
voltage rails would you know would help solve this issue all right so coming down here what we see is the capacitance and you can see it is also related to uh, the voltage okay so um just want to point that out it's just like the fits that it's it is related to voltage all right, so what do you guys think about all this stuff? You know, if you have a golden ear that can hear the difference of a power cord, it's got to be because your amplifier was not designed with high enough voltage. So you got too much ripple because you're losing voltage at the input. And so the extra few tenths of voltage that you might retain by putting a large size cable uh, is doing something for you and you know of course if you can do that spending ten thousand dollars is probably better than spending two hundred dollars right or spending fifty dollars <laughs> or just spending 20 bucks for a nice heavy duty power cable like I, I wish i had one to grab right here but it's probably on my big power supplies back here but yeah i mean you just need some copper guys and sure, shielding helps if you're going to run that power cable near any of your other cables. But shame on you. If you've got that kind of system, do a better job at routing your cables. <laughs> Keep all the signal stuff away from your power cables for hell's sakes. <laughs> oh my heck. You don't need to go spend a ton of money because you don't know how to route your cables. All right. Sorry. Uh, but seriously... If you if there's people out there that can hear the differences of changes made outside of the amplifier, you know, in the AC power section, if they can actually hear that, it means it. And if there is truth to that, if they can actually, they should be able to measure it too. That's my problem. They should be able to put a microphone out there and actually measure that there's been some difference, maybe a dB difference or something. Now. Again, THD may not measure any difference because THD is not, it, it's just one parameter and it's not a catch-all parameter like they try to make us feel like it is. Um, you know, there's gain distortion, phase distortion. Those things are, it, it, I would think it probably has to do with more with gain distortion. And you're not going to get that with the one watt uh, signal that they usually test that at. So... You know, I think it's all in how we test and why, you know, some people say, well, you have to listen to it. It's not a measured thing. Well, of course it can be measured. If you can hear it, it can be measured. Our ears are great, but they're nowhere near as good as a dog's ears. And they're for sure nowhere near as good as the instrumentation that we have. So, um, and there's nothing magic coming through. It's, it's science. So anyway, I just think if you regulate those power supply rails, if someone put a regulated circuit and did, you know, took an amplifier everybody loves, a PS Audio took one of their amplifiers and actually regulated their output rails, even at, no matter what the size and the heat sinking, if it doubled the size of the box, I think if they did that, those same customers that, you know, like their friend at Stereophile, I think he'd rave over it. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would. <laughs> Sorry, just taking a taking a smack there. But anyway, no. But I think people that have that go near that if they if it is if there is any truth that they can hear the difference of a cable or or something re power regeneration unit, I think it would totally hundred percent be taken care of by regulating the output rails. They're going to be faster. They're going to be... Now, the thing is, is you might, you know, then it might get into this whole debate on what kind of capacitor you want to listen to on the output of the linear regulator. Polypropylene, um, probably not a ceramic. <laughs> you could put a small ceramic there for high-frequency noise outside the hearing range, maybe. But you'd probably want to put several polypropylenes in parallel. I would think that that would be the way to do it. But anyway... Uh, Maybe I'll come up with that for Jat for the John Audio Tech power supply. We'll regulate it linear. That sounds like a trick, huh? That sounds like a good uh, man. 
I just thought of that. No, that was actually on my mind when I was coming up with this. I'm like, geez, why don't, yeah, it costs money. And, you know, John Audio Tech's really, like his whole amplifier design was based on uh, doing a really quality amp without spending a ton of money. But, you know what? Um, a house is only good as a foundation, right? A lot of people, a lot of times a power supply is just, it's just underappreciated, you know, and and it's the power supply that keeps the reliability of the unit. Usually, something fails, it's because of the power supply because they chinsed. They they were too cheap on the capacitors. They didn't re derate them enough, like some audio companies I know. So um, you know, there's no other industry that has to recap their products except for audio stuff. Kind of wonder why that is, huh? So, anyway, um, thanks guys. I hope this rant made sense and you can see how the transistor devices on the output are affected by changes in the voltage and possibly small changes in ripple. Uh, I think Douglas Self, in his book, that he actually talks about that and, more so, and maybe it affects it more so on the negative rail, but more so, less so, but why have anything so? <laughs> it's kind of like Paul's thing saying, we get most of it. Well, if you get more on the negative, less on the positive rail of, of ripple, you know, coming through your signal, why not get rid of all of it? Linear regulate the stupid things. Be done with it, right? Especially if you only have, say, a... Uh, 30 watt, you know, 50 watt, 100 watt amplifier. It, it wouldn't be too gigantic to reg, uh, linearly regulate the power supply rail. So, anyway, okay, this has gone way too long. Sorry about that. Hope it made sense. Let me know what you guys think. Hey, uh, if you liked it, hit the like button. Appreciate that. And oh, YouTube's got a new thing if you want to support the channel. It's uh, it's next to like button. It's some other thing where you can, you know, send me two bucks or something, buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> anyway, there's a little button down there that that's kind of new, and uh, there's the Patreon links. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna be working on some projects, and we'll get back to you guys. Okay. Hey, thanks for watching. Appreciate you guys. And using the links down below is a free way to help the channel too. And, gosh, we'll see you next time.